All right, we are recording. If you think you're in leading Christian communities in mission, then you're in the right place. Yay. Um, also, um, I thank you for your post. I feel in a good, odd way entering in because I feel like I know your stories, even if some of you have never seen your faces. Because you guys, ha I loved your interaction online. Wasn't it interesting? You guys are really interesting people. <laughs> okay, what is the deal? We are going to have to work on energy, you guys. I teach <laughs> at o'clock tonight, and if we're going to be like this for three hours, I'm going to have nothing left for me anyway. So I'm Terry Elton. I teach in leadership here, and um, I get to do a variety of um, elective courses, but this is the one signature course. Well, I guess that's a CPL. The first CPL and this one are the two signature courses that I get to be a part of. Um, so I am grateful for the opportunity. I don't teach this every year, so it comes up in, in rotations. Um, but it is, um, this is a fun class. Do you believe me, some of you? Yeah. I like the book. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's always a good start, right? It, when you start on a good on a good place. I thought I said to myself, I needed this for 22 years. <laughs> I don't need that's, it. Nothing like 22 years late, right? Yeah. No, but it's good. Awesome. Well, we have two students that are joining us live on uh, on Zoom, and we have one that's joining us. Um, she has CPE, so she is watching the video of this and then will participate in some other um, places later. She's an MA, DL student that came back to do, graduate that came back to do her MDiv, so she only has a few courses and this offer wasn't offered online. So she's trying to graduate and I'm for you all graduating, right? I don't want to get between you and graduation. Some of you, it's your first semester and you're like, no, graduation? Can't even imagine it. So, um, this is what we're going to do today. We're going to start by dwelling in the text um, in Exodus, and then we're going to move to some pieces um, uh, of our theory uh, and theology that we're going to talk today, and we're going to end by talking about the course project. I know that feels kind of backwards because that's kind of the nitty gritty kinds of stuff, but can you handle, can you put off your questions till later? Um, I promise to give you a break. And, but if your body needs a break before leave, I've, I've worked for 10 years with junior high kids. You are all better behaved than they are most of the time. There's a couple times that, you know, there's some exceptions, but overall, they're pretty good. Um, so feel free to do that. But if we're getting to a place and there's like five of you going, Terry, can we do this? That's totally okay. Um, I can kind of get wrapped up in this. And if we need to take a break, there's no magic time with regard to that. So we'll take one break kind of midway through and come back. So does that sound like a place to start? All right, with that, um, we're gonna dwell in Exodus. By the way, um, my practice will be that um, before class, some days the day before, some it will be you know by lunchtime or whatever on Monday, I will post my slides on the Moodle site. So these are already posted in a PDF for you to download and to use or whatever. So um, I figure there's no reason you have to write like crazy stuff that I already have printed, right? So those are available and those are there. So um, dwelling in the word is a uh, practice that um, I was introduced to by actually Pat Kiefer, who teaches here when he was doing some work with our congregation a long time ago. Um, at that time, it was, dis it was a disruptive practice for me. Um, I lived in a world where you studied the Bible, right? You tried to figure out what were the people in that time thinking and what were the questions and what does the Greek word for this or the Hebrew word for that or whatever. Um, and dwelling in the word was a different type of engaging God's word. And so I just want to say a, a, a bit about dwelling in the word, and then we will actually um, do that practice each time as we begin. And like this time, we'll do a text for like two weeks. So like last week you did, we're going to do the same text you did last week. So just as because um, some classes we've done the same text for 13 weeks, which is also an interesting practice. But, um, but here's, here's the posture um, of dwelling in the word. Um, Come to the text open. If we believe God's word is living, 
and especially as we join in community around it, that God shows up. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I promise to be there. You hear in scripture? So what, what would it be for us to join as a community around the text, to hear the word spoken out loud, to listen, to just let it capture our imagination, to wonder, maybe sometimes there are texts, I get stuck in the first sentence on something. And that's okay. To just hear what you hear, we'll pause um, after that first reading for you to, to listen to what resonated within you. We will read it again. Um, I like to have two different people read, often a man and a woman or people, you know, the sounds of voices and how people read text is different. Then we will pause again and then we will share with a neighbor, okay? What, and then the practice will be, Beth, what did you hear? Back and forth, right? And then she'll say, what did, you, what did you hear? And then when we come back together, we'll ask you to share, what did you hear your partner say? So your role in this is not to put your stuff out there for the group, but is to say, is a practice in listening to God, to the text, to yourself, to your neighbor. Does it matter which version? No. No. And I sometimes mix them up just to just to mix them up, right? So when we do it too, but that's a great question. Thank you. All right. So do I have two volunteers that would be willing? One, two. First time through, second time through. All right. We'll pause for a little bit and then you just read. All right. So go ahead. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. Can you hear? And he leads his flock beyond the wilderness and came to, um, is it Horror? Go for it. Yep. Okay. The mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consuming. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he led, when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses <laughs> hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my, of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen, seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, 
I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Turn to a neighbor and share what you heard. I'll give you about two minutes. I'll join you guys. How's that? <laughs> Can you hear? Or should I mute mine? Is it too loud? It's pretty okay. When you know what? I'll mute mine. You two talk to each other. Okay, okay, cool. That works just fine. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So I use this text every week this summer to open our sacred conversations on race workshop. Hmm. So I feel like I have dug so deep into this text, but it's so rich and I hear new things every time. Mm -hmm. Today for me, it was, um, and I, I don't have an, uh, an auditory memory, but it's the, the piece where Moses has to decide to turn to the side to go encounter God. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, <laughs> and, like this, the fact that he has to step off the path, he has to step mm -hmm. off of what he's doing, business as usual, mm -hmm. uh, caught me so this time in a way it hasn't before. I yeah. also, my favorite, my favorite um, I used to tell folks to just like plow through the, the nation names, mm -hmm. so not worry because it's overwhelming. And my favorite one from the summer was a girl who's just, she took it seriously. She plowed right through, and her thing, one of the things that she said was the hatiti. Yes. That giggle. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. My, my, my are just are the hatidis. <laughs> right. My funny side note is about they, uh, they show like fancy Christmas front decorations and and on TV and one of them, it was like they won the show for all of the greatest Christmas decorations. And they had a big oh, yeah. sign that said, the angle of the Lord. I know. <laughs> so every time I see the angel of the Lord, that's what it makes me think of. <laughs> was it like the Christmas wars or Christmas like yeah. battles or, oh my God, I really like that show. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, two things really stuck out at me today about this was um, if the bush was blazing yet it was not consumed um, just thinking about how with the same amount of resources God creates something that is on fire and doesn't have to use up what was already there but can kind of have this constant reusing of energy from the same source um and then i am living in this new context that's very steeped in their history and they are constantly looking to the past and so today um the i am the god of your father the god of abraham isaac and jacob made me think a lot about all right we're just forced to look to the past and what does it mean to not have the stories also of the people that come after? Like, what is the future? How do we turn ourselves towards the future instead of just towards the history? Let's, um, ooh, let's hear what, what did your neighbors say? I'm going to work on just moving this so they can pretend like they're not just listening to me. But you're actually with other people. Okay. Um, so. Oh, would you just start by saying your name as well, so we can learn names? I'm Sharon Ellington. Okay. Bruce said that he heard it so differently in the two different readings. Ah, huh. That just, just concentrating on listening instead yeah. of reading himself. 
is that um, the first reading we heard uh, compassion there, and then the second reading the power. Huh. And, and both that, are present. Both present, but, that's, that's, but just hearing the Cool. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kyle German. Uh, I was talking to V, and uh, one thing that she heard was uh, stop going no further, or come no closer, remove your sandals from your feet. Uh, it's like she was saying before again. And she kind of came up with the questioning of what was the reasoning behind like taking your sandals out and to get closer to the holy ground or for some other reason. Good question. What else? All right, way over there. Uh, so, so, sorry. so you talked about multifaceted, which is in the text. The, mm -hmm. the first thing um, has an addition myself. I, I was I wondering was, how you were going to hear this. I was just curious of that, knowing I don't often have Egyptian yeah. in the room. So, <laughs> yeah. So I was celebrating Tessa in, in a big uh, space last mm -hmm. April, and one Israeli Sephardi friend said, like, the text is talking about the Jews who are participating in oppression and like being a bit trampled. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what the others were doing in that process. Yeah. And that is a reflection to, like, one, one stories about community, single stories. Yes. Um, versus Christian communities that may have multiple stories yeah. within the same process. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is time for a yeah. narrow place. And that as part of our calling. So in the ELCA within like my, my personal identities, uh, being afraid of communities and communities being afraid of me. So how can God call us out of these narrow places mm -hmm. um, that limit our calls in fear or unexpected um, openness? Yeah. And then he talked about the bush being um, God calling us in unexpected places. Yeah. Some of you are still going, Luther Seminary, St. Paul, really? Really? <laughs> right? Of all places, God, really? Yeah. Okay. Love, I mean, that's a lot. Thank you. That's awesome. Two more. Yep, in the back. Um, I'm Kenny Bjorklund. Thank you. Uh, and Ian shared uh, that it was interesting how God not only called the Israelites out of Egypt as an exodus, but also into. Uh, into yeah. the land, the Hittite land, right? All of those. So it was both, one and both. Exodus. Yeah, by the way, I'm sending you the promise line, but it's occupied. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but out and in. That's interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, he was very particular about all this for, or just a matter of policy. There must be a specific reason for huh. this. Huh. Yeah. So he didn't just call Moses because Moses was around and kind of see a but he was also for a specific assignment. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. You guys, look at this. You guys are smart too. You're fascinating and smart. Uh, no. But think of all the different angles at this site. How many of you have heard this text before other than last week when we did right? But I'll honestly say these are some thoughts I have never thought of before. Some of them I have, right? Um, fascinating text. Fascinating text. Um, and it'll say fascinating. You can revisit it again. Um, thanks for dwelling. Um, let us uh, have a word of prayer. Gracious God, we come before your, you, your people, from all kinds of places in your world, all kinds of experiences, various callings that we feel you've placed on our life, various places for which you'll send us. For these moments, these hours, this semester, these Mondays that we gather here virtually and in this room, we ask you to show up. We ask you maybe to call our name every now and then. Give us a nudge to maybe think differently. 
maybe help us find a, a ministry companion and then send us out. That we're not here just for the sake of our own learning because you've called and sent us. And for this brief time in this semester, we will be gathered to do that work together. Thank you for Moses' story. Thank you for all of our stories. And thank you for the story that you are gonna craft in this semester as we join together in Christian community. All this we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Um, let's find out who's in the room. I could do attendance and I tried to print the attendance sheet and the printer wouldn't work. So, Let's flip it around. You tell me who you are, or tell us who you are, um, and let's do it this way. We'll do it somewhat orderly, just so that it'll be more, well, we don't have to spend the whole three hours on that. But um, tell us your name. Tell us the church you wrote about, because I got to read all your posts, but I doubt all of you sat down and read everybody's posts few of them, right? But they were really interesting. So tell us your name. Tell us the church you wrote about. And so like if you're in the, if you're a Methodist, tell us about that or if you're wherever. Okay. Um, tell us what degree program you're in and one fun fact that we just may not know about you. All right. Give you a moment to think. We'll do you two last. All right. And I will try and move the camera around so you can see. And just because people that sit in the back row should have to go first, don't you think? People in the back row. <laughs> and some of you, it was just because after we're, we're going to start in the back, and I'm not going to start with me. We're going to start in the back over there. All right. And I'm literally going to walk around. So our friends at home, are you getting seasick yet? No, not yet. <laughs> it'll it'll be good to be able to hear better. Be yeah. able to see each other. All right. All right, here we go. I gotta get closer. All right, introduce yourself. Just so close. I know. <laughs> <laughs> just for a moment. All right, so you guys start. You start. Fun fact. He didn't say a fun fact. Did he say yeah, a fun fact? I like to. Uh, the Ooh, oh. there's a story there. We can ask more later. All right. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Becca Holland. I'm from Minnesota. Sorry, I like forgot what you're supposed to say. <laughs> she was so moved. She was so I know. Oh, stage fright. Oh, I'm an MDiv. I'm a senior, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota. Both my parents are Lutheran pastors. I'm a cradle Orthodox Lutheran. Um, I'm in the ELCA, but there's a lot of qualms with the ELCA that I like to voice. Um, fun fact. Fun fact. I'm mom of two little babies, and I'm married to a former Catholic who's really excited about being married to a female oh. pastor. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Patty Bjorklund. Um, I'm a deacon at Oak Knoll Lutheran Church, ELCA. I've been for a while. Uh, my degree program is I've come back from AMDiv. I uh, received my Master of Sacred Music uh, degree from Lutheran in the early 2000s, so here I am again. And a fun fact to be about me is I'm a competitive baker. Ooh, <laughs> more questions there <laughs> later. I <laughs> regret <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> My name is Ian Jerzyk. Um, from Washington State originally. Uh, moved here for college four years ago. Um, I'm in the MDiv program. And oh, uh, I was raised North American Baptist. Um, and then now attend a covenant church in St. Paul. Um, and interesting fact, uh, my dad worked at Delta Airlines, so I've uh, traveled quite a bit. So I've been to every continent a few times. Nice. I like that. That's a good fun fact. All right, over here. Uh, Is that close enough? Can you see? All right. Vinicius F. Reeves um, from Liberia, MA program. What church in Liberia? I, don't, I can't remember. I belong to non-denominational. Okay. 
-hmm. And so I wrote about the um, church as a whole yeah. from a non-denominational perspective or an ecumenical perspective. Uh, what's the fun fair? I, I, I don't know much. I think when I came, when I, when I came January, I should have come in uh, winter gear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And I came without... You, you moved here in January? Yeah. Oh, that's no winter gear, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> they should have met him at the airport with a parka. <laughs> anyway, the fact that you're still here is a good sign. All right. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jacob Hansen. I am a youth director Oops. over at Asia United Methodist Church. So I'm a I'm a Methodist, that's the church I wrote about. I'm a second year MDiv, which I always get this mixed up. Is it like a sophomore? I know, it should be, but it's Midler. Midler. Because that that's a no word, that's me. a word. That's, that's yeah. English for you here. Um, and my fun fact is I got married over the summer and so now I'm figuring out what it's like to be a husband. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Lots to learn. Nice. All right, All right B. Um, B, M. Div, Midler, where am I missing? Church. Um, I'm a Lutheran. Uh, Fun fact. I don't have any. Oh, but come on. on. <laughs> these people but, that know you don't believe you. But, well, people that know me better not share nothing. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Something that I am proud of is my eight-year-old daughter made it to the Junior Olympic, Olympics in gymnastics. And Yay! Nice. This season. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> All right, let's go over here. Oh, God. All right. Let's start there. Um, I am Kyle German. I'm from North Dakota. I am an ELCA uh, MDiv first year, first semester. Um, uh just fun fact now yeah okay um i guess my fun fact is i have never been to a state west of north dakota but i've been to china for two years we got to get you to the yeah. western part of the united states at yeah. some point right. hello internship hey. let's make a move all right yeah i'm stephanie i'm um a reluctant reluctant ma i'd love to switch over to the end of program Yay, candidacy. Um, but it's my second year, and I am a e cradle ELCA, but was kind of raised Baptist because both my parents are um, were raised Baptist, so that's how they raised me. Uh, they didn't know better. <laughs> and um, fun fact, I currently have three jobs on campus, plus my own business. So, so you're bored. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> right. Mary. Mary Coleman. Um, second year for MACCC and uh, AME denomination. I really cannot think of a fun fact at Luther since mm -hmm. I've been here <laughs> at this stage in my life. Fun fact. Well. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, what, well, okay, one thing I could say is I was, I started school as a Catholic and I went through my teen years in the Church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. I did some adult years as a Baptist. I married a Methodist. You can, she's and, in the, she's the ecumenical <laughs> part. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. And right. I was ordained. Wow. Non-denominational. Wow. So I'm You've back. got it covered. Mary. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, I don't. That's a you know. that's a pretty good fun fact. Yeah. Yep. All right, yeah. I'm gonna go over here first, so we finish over here. All right. All right. Here you go. There you go. You're in the. Either one. No, go ahead. I'm Sharon. Uh, I'm from California. I'm Dev. I started at PLTS. This is my very last semester. We'll do a dance at the end. Uh, my dad graduated from Luther in 1960, the year before I was born. Um, and the fun fact is my mother and my daughter and I are the very first 
three generation family to graduate from California Lutheran University. Oh, nice. That's cool. So we're a CLU family. Oh, very good. Awesome. Well, you're up. I know, Drew. Uh, I'm yeah. Drew. I use they, them, there, or he, him, his pronouns. Um, I just transferred here from Chicago Theological uh, Seminary in Chicago. Um, so it's my second year. Um, I grew up going to Glory Day in uh, St. Paul. I go to Humble Walk now. Um, fun fact. I'm trans, and I just legally changed my name last week. So it's legal. Yeah. yeah, so I'm like official. I'm awesome. a, real, a real person. Cool. All right, here we go. Back over here. It's a little close, but I don't want to. There you go. All right. Ooh. All right. <laughs> so. All right. Well. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Evan Meester. Uh, I'm from Iowa. Uh, the northern area near Mason City. Uh, I come from a denomination called the RCA, uh, which is a very small denomination. It's uh, kind of closely related to uh, Presbyterians. And uh, let's see, I'm an MDiv first year or junior, however you say that. And my, let's see, my interesting fact, uh, I used to play dulcimer a lot, I guess. It's kind of know. like a flat guitar for those of you who don't know. Cool. Awesome. Oh, yeah, hammer dulcimer sometimes, yeah. Those cool. are fun. Awesome. All right. Hey, I'm Emily Edmonds, and I'm from Virginia. Mm -hmm. and, and then we can see. <laughs> I'm a first-year MA student and with the ELCA. And I guess, fun fact, uh, started taking dance classes last week. <laughs> Woo -hoo! Fun. Yeah. Hey. Awesome. That's <laughs> good. Uh, Kizomba. Nice. All right, here you think, can we see you? Here you go. There we go. I'm Rita Diaz from Liberia, a Lutheran. Mm -hmm. I'm doing MTH with post acute joint CNL. Mm -hmm. um, confess, I don't like bread, but I'm eating bread every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. All right. Our free, can you see it? Yep, there we go. Lutheran pastor by the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Tanzania. Uh, in the last year, I'm in the last year of the program, which is MA in Congregation and Leadership. And the fun fact is that most of my time when I'm free, I like watching movies, especially uh, good movies, which there are more interesting things like uh, history mm -hmm. things cool like that. awesome yeah. nice mm -hmm. all right can we see that yep yeah uh, my name is Shafa from Liberia uh, MA of leadership and innovation second mm -hmm. year uh, I work on the I'm a patient student and I work on the church in general in Liberia and what else you have no fun fact. I, I, I have a four-year-old boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. that's nice. Awesome. All right, we're gonna jump to this row way over there at the end. This is gonna be a workout. I didn't anticipate. <laughs> All right, deep knee bends. All right, go. Yep. Hi, I'm Philippos. Um, Sorry. I am somewhere in between my second, third year, or something. Um, mm -hmm. But I know I'm going internship next year, probably. Um, <laughs> let's see. And I wrote about, I wrote a comparative reflection about the church I grew up in, the mm -hmm. church I'm currently in, which is uh, Coptic Orthodox Church and uh, the ELCA. Mm -hmm. And fun fact, so I, so my spouse is a UCC pastor, so I have mm -hmm. a foot in both congregational and Lutheran mm -hmm. worlds, but I'm unapologetically a high church Lutheran. Um, so spells and bells and a rosary every day. And I, I firmly believe in that. So. There you go. <laughs> Love it. Hi, I'm Gia. Um, I am MDiv. I'm a senior. Um, ELCA, but I grew up Baptist. Um, is that it? Fun fact? Yep. I climbed my very first mountain this summer. All right. All right. All right. All right. Which one? 
Colorado, Texas Park. If she was going to say Buck Hill, I was going to tell her. <laughs> no. So the I, knew it, I knew it wasn't Buck Hill. That. So the Rockies is what you find. Okay, my name is Lisa Boone, and um, kind of like Mary, I grew up, was baptized, a baby is Roman Catholic, stayed there till about third grade. When I was a teenager, I came familiar with the Churches of God in Christ, stayed with them. Then I went to the United Methodist Church, Park Avenue, oh, and then yeah. <laughs> um, the Presbyterian Church, Kwanzaa, and now I'm in a non-denominational that has a... You um, feel like you're... <laughs> <laughs> and, and <laughs> with, the, with the emphasis in Pentecostalism, um, then... And so I uh, registered as MDiv. This is my first year starting, but I'm not sure. I'm going to go talk to someone and look it over. And an interesting fact about me is that I love history and that I was able, like, even before I graduated from high school, to help my family pull together some of their roots. And when people, I have an 85-year-old friend who will say, Lisa, what is this in history? And if I know, I will tell her. And she's like, you need to teach that more. So. Awesome. Passion for history. Yeah. All right. Yeah, next class, you got to sit right there, Mary. All right. There's a chair even. All right, um, I'm Hallie. Um, I am an MA senior, but I am discerning a call into chaplaincy, which might mean I might be an MDiv. So that's kind of interesting. Um, I am an ELCA Lutheran. I've been part of the ELCA church my whole life. Um, I'm originally from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, my boyfriend's family is very traditionally Catholic, so it's kind of interesting mm -hmm. to see their opinions of me at seminary. <laughs> um, and a fun fact about me is that my right eye is two colors. Ooh, my, that is a totally fun so, fact. Yeah. If, I was going to say, I am used to it, so if you guys want to come look at some <laughs> <laughs> She opened the door. Okay. That's awesome. There we go. All right. So I'm Beth Parks. I'm a second year MDiv. Uh, grew up here in Minnesota. Lived in California for 13 years and back in Minnesota now. Um, fun fact, uh, ELCA. Fun fact, I spend a num number of Saturday nights at my home congregation out in Plymouth helping with the jazz concerts, and one's this Saturday night. Right. Somebody is a fan of jazz, let me know. I can give you the details. I'll talk cool. to you. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hannah. Uh, I'm originally from South Korea. I've been here almost 12 years old. I go to Mount Park United Methodist Church. I'm a Methodist, <laughs> and one fun fact is I love to make kimchi. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> We're going to have to eat in this class. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, my name is Joe Davis. Uh, um, this is my last year. I'm one of, one of two artists in residence here in an MA in Theology of the Arts. Um, so I who's the other one? Uh, she's new, and I, I don't. I feel bad. I know her name, so we just had a lunch meeting. Was okay. It Jen? Thank you. Yeah, Jen. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, she's awesome. So get to know her too. Um, and so I wrote my paper about church outside of the church walls. Mm -hmm. Um, but I grew up in like a interdenominational, charismatic church of God in Christ. But then I I kind of stumbled into the Lutheran church and started rocking heavy with the Lutheran church in like undergrad. Um, so now I, I say that I'm a Pinta Lutheran or a Luther Costume. <laughs> and, we need um, a little bit more of that joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's what I bring okay. to the space. Uh, fun fact about me is um, I'm, I'm able to be a full-time uh, spoken word artist, writer, performer, which I'm grateful for. So, yeah. My name is uh, Tim Schrader, MDiv senior, originally from Wisconsin. Huge Packer fan, hugely disappointed from last night's game. Um, well, the mic was in due to where we did. <laughs> so I didn't have to come in and walk in on that today. That's great. Um, let's see, I'm yeah, Neil Skye, and I wrote about kind of the intersectionality of how we future leaders are going to be birthing in kind of the yeah. new church yeah. and the difficulty and excitement of that. Um, and the fun fact about me is that my family owns a traveling carnival in Wisconsin. Oh. Yes. That 
is a fun fact. Yeah. 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 We have all the games and rides. And that is so ever. funny. I didn't know. Yeah. All right. Which one of you wants to go first? I'll try and make try and make it bigger. <laughs> Can right. you guys? Not very well, but I'll try and. Okay. Okay. Uh, is that any better? Um, I can't get it to go. Anyway, hang on. Just go ahead and talk, and I'll see if I can. Okay. My name is Corla Masters, and I just graduated from an MDiv program in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where I live. And I went to uh, Eden Seminary, so Drew UCC Seminaries um, are great, or can be great. Um, so I'm, I'm doing my Lutheran year at Luther this year, and I'll do internship next year um, because I was the only Lutheran in my whole MDiv program um, the whole three years I was there. So I that combined with, I'm, I'm not trying to one-up Ms. Coleman or anyone, um, but my, my partner is a Church of God in Christ ordained elder, so I feel like there's some good Luther Costal um, household vibes going on in the class already. I just want to plant my flag in that a little as well. Um, my mother is also a Lutheran pastor who was raised in the Assemblies of God. So my upbringing is very much um, one that is Lutheran with a Pentecostal flavor to it. Um, so I'm excited to hear that there are other folks in the class yes. for whom that's true. Um, and other folks with some ecumenical experiences. And I, awesome. did I Nope, you're awesome. And I, work, and I work for a Presbyterian church right now, so. Oh, just to add it. It's all over. <laughs> all right. I'm Brigitte Simpson. I'm a senior MDiv, I'm currently on internship in rural Texas. Um, I was Ooh. born and raised in South Minneapolis and have never lived out, well, I spent one year living on campus at Luther in the 55108 zip code, but other than that, I have always lived in the 55406 zip code until this year when I am now living in the middle of nowhere. My fun fact is that my friends have deemed my neighbor who is um, a white cow. Her name is Becky with the good hair. So. <laughs> you had good hair, but you know, well. <laughs> Well, one thing I do know, we have a class with humor. I'm happy about that. I'm Terry Elton. I live in Apple Valley, Minnesota. Uh, my first class of Luther Seminary was in 1987. There's only been a few years since then. I haven't had to put my foot on this campus. I have tried to leave Luther Seminary, and God just pulled me back in. So I did my MA in, uh, I was an early CML grad that, that concentration did not exist when I started because it took me 11 years to do my two-year MA um, while I was working full-time. Um, and I graduated and God kept stirring questions in me. And then there was this PhD program in CML that, that surfaced. So I was the first, our first grad in CML in the PhD program was an international student from um, Taiwan. I was the first North American for the North American Missiology degree. We, we had this North American Missiology degree and the world showed up. We've never had a class that didn't have international students in it. So it was a fascinating, fun ride. I did my PhD in a much shorter time than my master's, so thankfully. And then I started working in the contextual, with contextual learning in the Children, Youth, and Family Concentration part-time when I was finishing my PhD and start, started doing some adjunct teaching, and I stuck around. Um, became full-time staff, directed a center for children and family ministry my first years here, and then um, actually my dad, my fun fact is my dad's office, my dad used to be a professor here, he started here in 77, and his office used to be right out here, and so um, this was where, like at eighth grade when you had to go to your dad to work day, this is where I went just to get out of school, and now I work here. That's creepy. <laughs> so, I just thought it was fun. I got to play ping pong, table tennis, and I got to, I don't know, go to one class. I think that's what I did last year. But anyway, um, so 
that's a little bit about me. I'm married. I've got two children, um, 21 and 24. Our oldest daughter just got married. So more power to you figuring all that out. So I now have a new title, mother-in-law. That's creepy. I don't know what that means. But. <laughs> so, so that's a little bit about us. I hope that in this time, um, we learn each other's stories. Um, I'm glad and sad that we didn't have class last week because I really feel like Honestly, that was a fun exercise to get you thinking. I mean, it wasn't a long paper. Hopefully, it wasn't terrible to write. But it was really fun to just read through and get a sense of where people's churches are and the challenges that they were going on and their experience um, and whatnot. And part of the joy of this class is each other, you guys. It's not me. It's not the content. It's the sense of wrestling with some of these issues with colleagues and getting different perspectives from different of different generations, people from di that grew up in different parts of the world, um, people that have different, you know, came into church at different times and seeing their roles different as we move forward in, in the future. So leading Christian communities in mission, hey, this is what it looks like. This is what the, look around, this is the leaders, right? God's church is interesting and we get a chance to be in conversation. So this is a fun, fun class for me to teach and I hope you join into that. All right, what I want to do is I want to talk about what is this course all about? What did you sign up for or what did you have to take to cross the line to graduation? Um, whichever way you want to look at it. Here's a couple things about um, leadership. Learning how to lead, uh, this course is about learning how to lead in a global context where the Western church is one among many voices. Uh, back in the 80s, which I'm sorry to even use that, I had a 35-year class reunion over the weekend, and so, wow, I just feel that much older. But um, um, when I started classes here, okay, um, we weren't asking that question. It was pretty much church in a box. What I mean by that is, here's seminary, here's what the church needs, pastors, which is mostly what was here, a few MAs, come in, do these things, and go out and do that job. It was like a, you know, a pastor factory. I mean, not really. It didn't mean you shouldn't bring your personality, but it means learn to preach, learn to do pastoral care, right? Maybe learn to do a budget, learn some exegesis, and you're good kind of thing, right? And there is an assumption that if we all just knew those basic practices, we could all lead well. It didn't work out. Well. Quite that way. I was leading in a church at the time that was, we would call a mega church. I started in 86 uh, and went there 16 years, whatever that, do the math of that. Um, and um, what I loved about the congregation, well, first of all, the congregation grew from 3,500 to almost 10,000 in my time there. And so I was just running. Right. I'm like, you know, this is like we were we were planted in a place where it's the largest growth at that time, that county in Minnesota. It's kind of if you build it, they will come. But it was also a church that was willing to ask really different questions. And so I I literally was formed and shaped as a young adult church leader as well, we can try that. Let's try that. Let's think about it to to think about we were Lutheran. To think about our Lutheran theology, our Lutheran liturgy, our Lutheran traditions, that we're always having the deal to be in conversation with our context in the real time. What I learned is that's not what 99 point whatever percent of the other congregations around us were. Um, I had only been really, because even before that I'd been in, in um, contexts that my dad had led that were, that were leading some different kinds of ways. And so, but, but we were still wrestling with just within the Western box. And my questions brought me into asking the missional questions. What does church look like outside of Christendom? What does church look like outside of this kind of wrapper that we have, right? And now, look at this room. We are, you know, in that many years, looking really different. And yet our congregations don't reflect some of the diversity that we do right there, right? Um, and, and we're still learning kind of how does, how do we lead, how do we lean into that new reality, right? So we're going to think about what does it mean to be church in a global context. Our church has two partners that we take seriously. 
One is in the Dominican Republic and one is in the Lutheran Church in Tanzania. I was there. I just missed North Free by a little bit of time um, this year. But the sense of, and to be in true partnership and to learn from and with people that are in different locations, what does that really mean? As well as the people that are in our neighborhood that we have a global neighborhood in many places as well. So what does it mean to learn to lead in a global context where we have many voices talking together? In a North American context that's getting increasingly religiously pluralistic and where the church is no longer of cultural privilege, the Christian church. Sorry, I should have put that in there, right? My community, my, I will, good question. I will answer that and we'll talk more about that as we go. But um, my congregation lived in a, a kind of rose in a, in a context where most people were, were, were um, not only Christian, but some Protestant version of that. May, and then maybe with some Roman Catholic sprinkled in, right? And so early conversations that uh, were happening when I was in um, leadership were like, Wednesday night church night, why are you taking away Wednesday night church night? Or Sunday morning is for worship, right? Why are you putting things on Sunday? That assumes a cultural privilege, right? None of my Jewish brothers and sisters had that luxury, for example, right? Um, so what does it mean to lead Christian communities in a time when the whole culture, the society is not momentum with us or isn't, isn't in partnership with us maybe, right? Holding values that maybe would be the same, right? All right. Um, in, what does it mean to lead in light of God's triune the triune God's mission, not our denominational polity or our doctrine primarily, but our theology about who we believe God is. This is this was what brought me to my PhD. I hope God doesn't do that to you. No, um, but this sense of I just kept pulling back the layer, pulling back the layer, and I'm like, uh, somebody, you, Rebecca, you said you have this bittersweet relationship with the Lutheran church. I always have as well. I'm like, I'm asking questions that are trying to peel back some things. And what I found is I had a theological question, right? That the answers weren't sufficient to me. There's gotta be more, right? Um, don't just give me a Lutheran doctrine. I, put me in conversation. And so we're gonna talk a lot about who's God and then who's the church in light of who God is, right? Um, what does it mean to learn to lead in light of our own uniqueness and God, how God has shaped us both as leaders and as communities? Um, if you're in a denomination, my hope and prayer is that that's where this one is. You're not a cookie cutter of every other church in that denomination, right? Because there's particular gifts and there's particular needs of your unique community. So not only who are you, but what is that community, that local Christian community? And I say Christian community can include congregations and other faith communities that may have different expressions. Um, it could be nonprofit, but it could be denominational offices, whatever. In light of the uniquenesses of that local community and their neighbors. If we're called and sent, we can't forget who our neighbors are. Okay? This is some of what we're going to address. Oh, sorry. It's a habit. My PowerPoint's not on there. I'm glad I didn't, you know, like scroll you people through. Uh, what we're going to do, um, this, this class takes like the iceberg, and it says, here's what we see of congregations or whatever the, the community that you're going to study, right? And we're going to say, I wonder what's below the surface. Or I wonder what happens when I look at it from a historical perspective. Or I wonder what insight I get by looking at their finances. Or I wonder what insight I get by talking with charter members and new members. Or new visitors, right? People new to the community. I wonder what insight I get about this by talking to their neighbors. Um, so this course is taking a community that most people just see the, what's above the water. And you're going to 
you're going to go deep fish, deep, deep fishing or deep sea snorkeling, not snorkeling, uh, scuba diving, right? <laughs> Don't snorkel. And if it's really cold like this, bring a, a warm wetsuit because it's, it's cold. So what we're going to do is in, uh, probing below the surface, engaging culture, its realities and assumptions. Okay? That's maybe the water of this, right? To think critically about your own view of church, theologically and sociologically, as well as the community of which you're going to study. Does that make sense? And sociologically are like the interviews, the way that you're going to analyze and, and ask questions is that's what that we're going to equip you to do some of that. But also to think, what does this mean about who God is? What's their imagination <clears throat> about that? Is God, do they think God shows up at worship when they gather each time? Or is God really this God of the past? Doesn't really matter today, right? Um, whatever. Um, and then third, to understand the pressures and realities facing the people in this context today. Um, lots of things are going to, and, and even as you talked about in your post, some of you are having challenges because you're growing. Your church is growing faster than you can keep up with it. Other people's challenges are people are moving away, right? Other challenges are saying our, our gathered group does not look like the makeup of our community. What does that mean? Some communities are saying our pressure is we have a generational divide. We have older folks that want church like this, and we have younger folks that want it like this, right? And I could keep going. Those are just the tip of the iceberg. So those are some of the things we're going to address. Um, <clears throat> in, uh, we're in a time some people call postmodern. You can, you can call it a lot of other things as well. But modernity was a time when we believed in progress. We believed you do something. If it doesn't work, you study it. You learn more. And then you get better. And you keep advancing, right? And that came out in all kinds of ways, anywhere from people's children, they thought they'd have better jobs or higher paying jobs than the generation before or whatever. There was just this sense of, of advancement as a society, as a culture. Then we hit a time that said, oh, maybe that's not so. Let's take a right hand turn. Called that, among other things, postmodern, right? Well, um, in, in an advancement, in a betterment, in a progress kind of um, imagination. There's continuous change, a sense of incremental, linear, predictable, or change that can be expected. So, for example, as humans develop, that's mostly continuous change. I am in my 50s. I would like to think I'm in my 40s, or some days even in my 30s, but my body tells me sometimes I'm in my 50s. <clears throat> I talked to other people in their 50s and said, so have you got bifocals yet? Oh yeah, I got trifocals, man. I got your beat, right? Like one day I literally was sitting in my office. I'm like, I cannot read the text. Yeah, so guess what, you know? A lot of people, early 50s, have to get bifocals. That's a developmentally, our eyes, that's around the time you gotta get the oil change. No, that's the time, right, that your eyes start giving out. Right? There's predictability in our human development, right? That's continuous kinds of change. There's also things that happen that aren't predictable. That's discontinuous change, right? So discontinuous change is disruptive. Terry, you now have cancer. Boom, that's a disruption of that, right? Unsettling, nonlinear, surprising, challenges our assumptions. We have operated the church around continuous change in many places. Um, and more and more, we're experiencing church that's, hey, that was growing, you were growing, you were on a trajectory, or things were good, and then boom, it took a right or left hand turn. Beth, did you wanna say something? Okay. Um, this came up in your reading for, for last week, so I, I don't wanna uh, deal a lot with it, but we're gonna talk today about adaptive challenges. And adaptive challenges are the ones that happen when we take these right or left-hand turns. And, and um, technical challenges are the kind that we can do this way. 
What have people done in the past? How do we learn from the past? How do we apply that to the future? And there are some times that we need that kind of response. But more and more, we need these kinds of, and if you take these kind of approaches to this kind of a challenge or change, it just doesn't work. Okay, it needs something more. So that's, that's just to kind of talk about kind of the undercurrent of this course is helping us think about how to lead in times that there's, there's disruption. Okay, what if, we didn't know where God was taking us. If I'm honest, I'm pretty clueless. I'm not hopeless. But if you ask me to describe the church five years from now, 10 years from now, I'm not sure I could do it with much accuracy or, or conviction that I would be accurate. If, if you ask me today to describe go back 10 years and say what it was today, I, would have, I wouldn't have guessed this. So it's based on kind of some of that. Um, but I do believe this. God is present. God's spirit is moving in really fun and interesting and disruptive ways. And humans like it and not so much. Both. And many of the churches that I'm connected with denominationally and congregationally are struggling to know how to lead, to know how to, how to live and lead in a different way. So what if we don't know where God is taking us? What if the basic pattern is not progress, but disruption, or to think theologically, death and resurrection? You guys, we, the Lutherans, have been baptizing people into death and resurrection for for a long time, and yet when it happens to us, we act as if we don't know what it is. Have you ever been in the time when you felt like you were facing death, or you at least felt like you were at the end of what you knew? And you just went, all right, God, where are we going? Maybe that's what got you here in the first place. Maybe that's what you're wondering about right now. But what if death and resurrection, not progress, was maybe the pattern of what God's working in us? What if the point of all this is in church? Save the church. What if the point of all this is God's creative and redemptive mission reconciling all of creation. I might be out of a job. <laughs> right? But if that's happening, I think I'd be willing to give it up. I got other things I can do. I'm not sure I'm a competitive baker. Who is the competitive baker? I'm not sure of that. I'm not going to earn a living now, right? But what if the church is secondary or third or somewhere down the list of things that are important? A tool. It's a tool. It's a community. It's an instrument. Community will continue. The church as, as the means. But it also depends, right, on how you define on church, church, right? And what if it's a resource, not the source? God right. is your source, yeah. but the church is your resource. Yeah. See, there's different things that we can start thinking about, right? My hunch is the body of Christ church isn't going away. But certainly a couple of these forms might, right? A couple of us might be willing to light a match, yeah. <laughs> right? Or at least deconstruct some things for the sake of a different future, right? Um, what if is it something I want you to wonder? This is a playground to think about things before you fully thought them out. You can say them out loud even if you don't fully believe them yet in this space. Does that make sense? 
play with, imagine, wonder with your colleagues. If this isn't maybe what's going on underneath here. I think we have lived through, in my church connections, at least a decade of deconstruction. People are tired. They're weary. Um, but there's a new group of people saying, all right, let's go. Let's pick up. Let's see what we need. What, can, what of all this stuff do we need to pick up and what do we need to leave? Who's with me? You know, and they start kind of coming out. It's kind of like a phoenix, right? Like, like, we're not dead yet. We're still here. Let's go. And I tell people, um, when people ask me what I do if I go on an airplane, I teach. That's my first one. They ask me what, I say leadership. And then they ask me where, and then I have to confess. I kind of teach pastor folks. People that, you know, and then I have to go into it all. But um, what was the point of all of that that I was going to say? Oh, but when people say, why do you like what you do? Especially people within church bodies. I say, you guys, I get a chance, and I see it in you, to see the leaders of the church as they're emerging into the church or at a point of their transformation. Some of you have been leading for a while, but you're turning into leading in a different way, or, you're in, or that's actually happening while you're here, right? Uh, and it first came to me when one of our, um, when I was teaching this class in the old curriculum when I was a PhD student, and one of the seniors was TAing for us, and um, he was awesome in our class. He was great. And one day, um, we were at chapel having communion, and all the people, all the students giving up communion were seniors. And I thought to Kevin, Kevin could be my pastor. Now, Kevin was significantly younger. Then he still is significantly younger than I. Um, but, but I'm like, if this is who God's calling and equipping, I want to be a part of your churches. That's what, like, triggered with me. It's not the, inst the institution is always going to have issues. It's going to, it, it hopefully will be a container that's more helpful than not in the years to come. But I don't care about that. I care about vibrant, vital communities where God's love is felt, the gospel's proclaimed, and they're witnessing to the reconciling, redeeming love in the world in tangible ways. I, that's what I want to be a part of. And the imagination of you all and the people that have come before you and the ones that keep showing up, I mean, we try and make this really hard. We make candidacy as total, if you're a Lutheran, as totally painstaking. <laughs> if we can kill you by forms, we will. <laughs> and if you still show up, we might, you know, like not always be as hospitable, right? But, but I honestly believe that God has called you here. And if God's called you here, I better be a good steward of your time. You know? So what if this is about God's stuff? I don't know about you, but I hope I'm baking on it because every night when I'm overwhelmed, I just put it down and I go to bed and I pick it up again in the morning, right? Otherwise, it just swirls in my head all night long. But there is a force that is bigger than us that we are tapping into and being we're going with, and that's what, that's what this course is trying to, how do you find that? How do you discover that? How do you do that with other people that honors their story, that is honest to the needs around you, right? And is about God, and discerning God versus other stuff is sometimes hard. Ah, I've done it again, all right. Leading means learning. Leading Christian communities today means claiming God's promises in Christ. In this religiously pluralistic and even increasingly secular world, what's the place of claiming God's promises in Christ? We gotta figure out how to do that. We can no longer just do good works and those us Lutherans just keep our little, you know, Christian card in our pocket. What does it mean to witness in our actions, in our words, in our lives to the promises of God? 
Leading Christian communities today means leading amidst dramatic cultural changes and uncertainty. We'll talk about some of those. Leading Christian communities today requires us to be both guest and host. That's part of being, not having the, the um, context value. You know, what does it mean to be a guest in society? But what does it mean to host? I was talking to one of our African students today about his MTH stuff and we were talking about how I learned this summer when I visited Tanzania about um, what it is to be guest on so many levels. They're really good hosts. Norfrey, would you just send that message back? Mm -hmm. yeah. On many levels, individually, as the church, as a society. Um, so what does it mean to be both host, guest and host? Leading Christian communities today means inviting people into a participatory journey of discovery about who it is to be a child of God in this time and place. It's not some intellectual answers or getting the doctrine right. And leading Christian communities today means being attentive to people within our community or our con congregation and outside in the context around it. How are we going to care for people? Where do we start? Um, hang on. Let me, I think I'm going to do this one. No. Let's pause there for a break. All right. Um, how about 3 o'clock? 15 minutes? Sound good? Thank you. I'm just going to leave this on, you guys. Is that cool? Cool. Cool. All right. Thank you. I haven't read all the way through the project, and I know you want to support to a Christian community. If I approach some people at Catholic Charities, would that be fine? Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah, or Basilica, totally. or something yeah, like that? Yeah, totally. That'd okay. Be okay. Yeah, so, that'd be great. All right, thank you. Oh, fun. I know. Oh, fun. No, I don't. No, it is. 
Well, um, yeah, and Bethel has a good football team for my mom's my alma mater. Beat them on Saturday. See, I did something. No, I did not. I oh, it was in Morgan. I Somebody, I, I was with some people that I, the person that I went to high school with, also went to high school with, and she came down from the union, and so she found it her husband. Yeah. And Pretty does not suffer football. Oh, so one thing, yeah, you gotta. Yeah, and they got a couple of but yeah. you know, it's not like St. John. But that ball is really, have your numbers yeah. increased? Um, yeah. So yes. The presence, like in sports, yeah. and certain yeah. things have really kind of ratcheted up. Yeah, they, they, they're, I think they're being more mm -hmm. from the home. Uh, we're bringing in, I know even. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, yes. Yeah. 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 In fact, um, Tim Bowman is one of our graduates from Bethel. I asked him that he needs to come back to this place to see And he had friends that were boys, his friend's wife. Um, and so I and, and my older daughters. Friend played at Sedona, so in Sedona played that whole couple And that was really fun to watch. It was a good match. It was fun. There was a lot of people in the couple. Some of the, uh, yeah, now, I don't know how many games, how many football games I'll be going to. Yeah, I know. But it's, uh, it's a lot of people. Yeah, it's a lot of people. I know. Well, and I mean, some days it's just awesome, right? Like yeah. on a beautiful day, yeah. and then some days it's just like, so There are definitely days where, especially when the team is good, it's like, I don't feel like we're yeah. can't beat it like that, but then we're having a bad team. So yeah. So did you play in these parts? Um, not in Colorado. Uh, so we have them in Oh, yeah, 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 well, I can't play. Yeah, I still do kind of intramural stuff. Yeah. What happens? Yeah. So I play. Like a thousand. Well, that's so what happened. Yeah. I was actually at the top. I need to like. Uh, I'm just just check with everyone. It was two lines. One was really bad. Now the other one was quiet. Yeah. And uh, I don't feel so good. Yeah. 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 Y
What kind of heart? Open it, open it. I know.
Yes. Did you do jumping jacks or anything like that? No. Corla, I like your cool wall behind. Wall behind. Oh, thank you. It's, it's really cool. If you ever get a chance to have exposed brick, just ask them to seal it. Oh, good. That gets real old. No. It is very cool, though. I like it. It is. I really like it. Okay. All right. So where do we start? That's probably a good, good question, right? Um, that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, we're going to start with our understanding of leadership. Leading Christian communities and mission is probably an okay thing to address leadership. I don't know. It's the first word. Okay. You can respond in some ways. Don't fall asleep on me, folks. All right. So. We're going to start with our understanding of leadership and specifically uh, of our context for leading. Okay, we're not going to kind of think of leadership that just kind of floats in the air. Leadership actually touches the ground, and so we're going to talk about it in that way. Um, we introduce this. Fine, it's okay, Jacob. Um, we introduced this in Christian Public Leader. Some of you have taken that course. Some of you haven't, but um, leading. Be Christian public leadership, Christian leadership, begins with following. So who are you following? Is a big question. Yeah, squirrel. No, um, no. Yeah, yes, Jesus. Right. No. Um, but what does that mean then? Right? Because at least I'll just I'll just own uh, you know, the good news if you're ELCA or or bad news or whatever is I got a I got a lot of quorums with the ELCA process even though I love the ELCA so no no problem but you're just too sweet um but to answer your question when he said Jesus that looks very different when you're learning to follow that's right the Jesus of your parents that's you right exactly a teenager or a young person you think you know better than your parents, and so you try right. things, but you find out some of the things that they knew, some of the traditions might actually work. be helpful. Okay, and yeah. then you begin to ask, or I don't know about you guys in the room, but somewhere in my late 20s and 30s, I begin to ask who I really was, because it was all my family and all my right. community, so then I wanted it to be me. Exactly. And now, I don't know if I know everything of who I am, but there's a whole lot of things I won't follow, and I don't care if I Right. Right. No, exactly. That's the process, right? That's this continual process. And so leadership in the church doesn't begin by saying, what does our bishop want? Doesn't begin by saying, what does the council want? You know, it says, who am I following? And then how does that align? Um, would somebody, Beth, would you mind getting the door? I should have asked you that. Okay, I'm sorry. How are you oh, there we go. Would you mind grabbing the door? Thank you. 
So who are you following? Oh, wrong way. To be a Christian public leader recognizes that we are first a disciple, a student, a learner, an apprentice, a follower of the triune God. God, and so what does it mean for God to have leadership in our own lives even before we lead? Um, what is God's word to us? Now, I don't know about you, but there are times that God and I have not been on the same page. <laughs> That's like almost an amen, don't you think? Okay. Like, okay. Um, I served in the St. Paul Area Synod. Uh, so I served in a congregation for 16 years. Six of those, my title was Director of Changing Church, okay? This was in the 90s. And, um, and you don't go from being director of changing church to assistant to the bishop in one job. But I did. So I left that position. I knew I was going to do my PhD, and I knew I needed to do some language stuff. And so I quit my position knowing that I was going to take a year to kind of do some things. I was going to look for another position, and I got invited somebody suggested I should look at this position and I was invited by the Synod office to do that and I went in for the interview and I sat outside in my car and I had a little talk with God I knew it was about a month before they were gonna make a decision because there were some people out of town it was in the summer and I said God if you want me here you have to change my heart I was, I, I was, you know, by this time, and this is back to, to your, is it Lisa? Yeah. Is to your point, it, it, I knew enough about myself to know I was just being darn stubborn. But I also knew that I just didn't see myself there. Like, I was, I was about changing the church, not being the bureaucracy of the church. I was the one questioning the rules, not enforcing them. Like, in my head, that's how it was playing out. The good news is that I really meant what I said. Earlier in my 20s, I maybe would have not, I would have said it but not meant it kind of thing. And I'm like, okay, God, this is your church. This is, I mean, I, I'm going to start a PhD for goodness sake. I, I don't control anything, right? But this sense of God soften my heart open my imagination, point me in the way, close other doors, whatever needs to happen if I'm supposed to be there. there, there that, that call was about half fun and half work. That's not bad. Um, and there were times when I just thought, like, throw up my hands. This, is, this was contextually, this is uh, the years right before the 2009 vote in the, ELCA, and um, the St. Paul Area Synod was a microcosm of the ELCA, so one of the first things that I um, was to do was we had a new bishop, Peter Rockness, and um, two churches had been sanctioned. One, because they let uh, a lesbian woman in a kind of relationship lead, and one, because they uh, had people lead that didn't have an MDiv, so they had, that were more, so we had a liberal and conservative, if you want to put them, that were both sanctioned. So like all, all everybody's fair game for that. And, and Peter came in and began doing some reconciling, some things like this, and we started having some conversation. But this is a time when the St. Paul Area Center was very divided. And, um, and I wasn't really sure, like, like why am I here? And um, just on some days when I'm like shaking my head and I, I worked with really, really struggling fighting congregations, like literally I had to, had to separate two people at a congregational meeting because they were going to fight in the sanctuary mm -hmm. kind of meeting. Um, and then, then I'd be sitting in my office and somebody would call and I just happened to pick up the phone and we'd have a conversation and they're like, thanks for being there today. I needed to hear that. And you're just like, Okay, God, I get it. Like, it, it's, it was the little things, right? It wasn't the big things. It was being there at the right moment at the right time with my gifts or my whatever. And I'm like, all right, 
if it was up to me, I wouldn't be here. I did not see myself there. I have been trying to leave Luther Seminary for decades. God keeps calling me back. I wanted to live in more interesting places in St. Paul, Minnesota. I know. Yeah. <laughs> right? I got my husband to move from one suburb to another, though. But here's the deal. On every, any given day, I sit down and the world shows up in my classroom at our table. I have conversations. And, and I'm, I grew up in Southern California. It doesn't look like this. And now look at who's here. And so suddenly by my staying, the world has changed around me. And I get to live into that environment. God has different imagination than I do. Am I willing to first follow God? Leadership begins with followership. But then it's about staying connected to God. My times when I'm most frustrated in leadership are usually, there's usually something else going on. One of the things is maybe the worshiping community. I've had times... So I'm not, my husband works at the same church that I worked at. So it's a weird, I don't know what to do to worship because it's, it's a, I can worship there, but it's, it's, it's not where I would choose to be. Let me just say it that way. It's where we are because it's where he serves. Some of you have had to do that as a spouse, as a, as a um, person, uh, as a kid, you know, as your dad or your mom or whatever, or other reason. Um, and so sometimes the community of which I'm in isn't most spiritually filling, let me put it that way. And, and I just have gotten crabby rather than do something about it. <laughs> None of you would ever do that, though, I know, right? <laughs> and so it's like, all right, what are you going to do? Um, Christian public leaders are first and foremost Christian. So what does it mean to tend to your own souls? If you got nothing, you got nothing. I'm sorry. It ain't about you. Okay, there's a little bit about you. But we're a vessel. We're a conduit. We are God's ambassadors in the world. And if we're not staying connected to the one for which we are to lead within God's mission, we're doing it on empty. Yeah. So I'm trying to phrase my question in, in ways that are not that are not a statement or a rant. Um, missiology. Just in case you can't, it's all right. Yeah. How's like, that? Please stop. Please. No, yeah. right. So you know, missiology, and I'd say possibly like astrology are some of the most abused. Yeah. For um, sure. For sure. Categories. For sure. Um, one of my um, Feeling in process pet peeves is the word mission and mission. Yep. Because of the amount of baggage around it and because yep. of also clergy misusing that yes. word and making Fair. promises that are not nailed to the ground. Yep. Um, and that they know are not the reality of their congregation. Yes. So the marginalized are have, who have been deceived and heard before are yet again given false hope that are deceived and heard again. Fair. Um, so how do we, before we enter into the realm of, of God's mission, Redefine mission yep. and missiology. Yep. And also look at that, like, what is our role? Because yep. a lot of the church sure. growth stuff is like for oh, man. white straight couples with 2.5 So, what is our And the dog or a cat. Yeah. <laughs> what is our projection in the midst of God's right. mission right. there? Yeah. Um, that's the question of this class. And here's, the, and here's the deal I am 100% with you. I'm also going to give you a little taste of that here today about our task in helping reframe that. Um, I didn't know I was a missiologist until my questions put me to missiology, right? And then I had to study the church and all of the abuse that we have done in the name of God. And, and to do that literally in a community of a small group of people of which their communities were the ones that which we did it to. Um, it's, it, it, you know, I just wanted to say several times, I'm sorry for all of them. I mean, my ancestors did, and that's not fair.
but but it's uh, so my the reason I say that is if I think the first move is to recognize it and feel the pain. That I, I mean, there are times when I have said stuff that has hurt my family. Sometimes intentionally, but mostly not. It was, it was not meant to be. But then to learn and to have to hear what that's like is move number one. Um, and to then pause and humbly step back and say, okay, I need to look at language, I need to look at behaviors, I need to be guest, not just host, right? All those things. Yeah, Lisa. A question, I, I don't want to make a statement either, but I, I talked for 22 years. Yeah. The first few years going in, it was, it was, I didn't know it was about me and what I was going to give them. And then someone gave me a, a, a little saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, for sure. And so, could the church... I mean, when you read the Bible, to me, it's all about relationship. And I don't believe as a body of Christ, I don't care what denomination you are, we're asking about relationship yet, yep, because sure. we still have too many formulas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think, I'll just give another example of um, <clears throat> those days that I hated being in prison office. Really, God? This is prison? No, uh, this is sentence. Um, one of the first things that that I learned to do was to say, what's, what's the pain in their life that that's causing them to do this? So like this church that was in this massive fight, this touched into some deep pain. Um, and I mean, I was, in, I was supposed to come in and help mediate. I didn't have to solve it for them, but I, had to, I wanted to not have them kill each other either. Um, and wonder, what was God deconstructing and reconstructing in all of that? Um, and, and that's when two things. One, I'd go into a room and say, I know there's pain here. It's not going to go away quickly. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know all the source of it. But I do know that God promises to show up when we invite God, and we're going to lean on some practices and we're going to put, so, so like I led with God. Are you with me? Like my human self doesn't have enough to bring to it, but God promises to be with us. So let's just see what God might have for us and open that up. But then second to personally, what I was like, just ready to just own somebody to like, God change my heart, bite my tongue, you know, hit me with the 10 foot pole. Just, you know, like give me space to figure out what did that happen for me, what, what's my, I mean, there's all kinds of things about, I had to learn different postures and different ways of leading when God's leading and that's not me. As a 20 some and 30 year old, I led with me. And sometimes me got in the way, said differently. And then God came, you know what I mean? Like I'd only go to God when I was in trouble. Anything? Great questions. All right. So leadership begins with following. God's address to us. The word became flesh, right? And dwelt among us, or as my colleague Dwight Shiley used to say, dwelt in the neighborhood, came and made residence among us. What? Yeah, pitch the pen, right? What would happen if God came in the flesh and dwelt in the neighborhood around the community where you are worshiping or connected. Where'd God be hanging out? What'd God be doing? The gospel of Jesus Christ is discovered through the particular for the sake of the universal. My question to you is, how did you discover God's unconditional love for you or God's grace in your life? I'm asking it more rhetorically. You don't have to confess that to anybody around. But I want you to think about that. I remember sitting in confirmation class, buying my time. There's a whole long story to that, but I could hardly wait to be done. Anybody else? Okay. Um, that might be another support group over there. Um, and studying 
what we believed about grace as the church. Now, somebody, I think you said this, Stephanie, Lutheran family, but Baptist background, so you were really raised Baptist. Well, my mom came from a Baptist background. My dad was a Lutheran pastor, and they really worked hard to develop a Lutheran, more grace-filled environment. But boy, those strong tendons, not only for my mom, but from all of the relatives, were very present, circling above our house. Even when we lived in California, and they all lived halfway across the country, right? Um, but I'll tell you when I discovered grace. I was 25 years old. I had been married for a year, and my husband came to me and said, I don't love you, and I never really wanted to get married. Oh, now what do I do? I, like, had no category for this. Disruptive change, right? This is not... <clears throat> I could tell you all the reasons why I don't get divorced, this doesn't happen to me, et cetera. Um, but the next year and a half of my life was pretty hard on multiple places. Um, bottom line is, in that particular moment of my life, I got what my confirmation pastor was trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. We were a church, I had worked with the youth ministry program of Kids of Divorce. We were one of the places in those days um, that had a divorce recovery ministry, it's called Starting Over Single. And people that couldn't have conversations in their own congregations would come. So it was a really interesting community-wide ministry. So I knew all kinds of people that had been on this journey as faithful Christians. Um, <laughs> my Baptist, um, Family, first of all, didn't know what to do with me as a woman in ministry, but then secondly, when they heard I was going to be divorced, that had no category for it, especially when some of my family members had been, had experienced abuse and had chosen not to be divorced, and they had opinions about me, probably fair, but, um, but that was shameful. They couldn't go there, and I get that. Um, but, but I had people that lived grace around me in so many different ways. I discovered the gospel in the particular of the pain and darkness and grace was good news and God's love for me. Trans I mean, it's, I, all of a sudden, all of these categories mattered in a way that changed me. And now not only did I know grace, but I wanted to be an ambassador of God's grace in the world. Um, I do not stand and judge. That is not what God has called me to do. I think the world does enough to put law on people. I want to be a bearer of God's promises. How about you? How did you discover the gospel in the particulars of your own life, in your community, in something outside of, you know, of your family, but maybe in a, in a context around you? God comes and dwells in the particular to make these big things known and matter. And the incarnation, God coming to earth in Jesus Christ, is the translation in the vernacular into... We can say, we can use different words so that people can hear the gospel in their own language, if you will. Where I figured out that I was a missiologist was as a youth ministry person for all these years, I was always trying to figure out how to communicate to young people the truths of scripture. I was always doing translation work. I was trying to put it in contemporary, I was always borrowing cultural artifacts and trying them on as metaphors and going back and like that one didn't work throw that one out this one worked keep that one right so i think this is our job as christian public leaders is working this sense of these things back and forth um this is the this is this is the moment i was speaking of um daryl gooder in the, his book continuing conversion of the church uh, this slide and the next two two quotes from him 
the incarnation of Jesus Christ is the event that brings about the salvation of the world and establishes the mission of the church. This event also defines how that mission is to be carried out. The reductionism of the gospel in Western, Chris, in Western Christendom is confronted by the person and work of Jesus Christ. Not by church doctrine, not by our practices, but by the person and work of Jesus Christ as both the context and criterion of the church's witness. And this calls for the church to repent and for continual conversion if it is to be faithful to that witness. So what does that mean? It means I am always accountable to the context and the criteria of who Jesus is as witness to God in the world. And this is not a simply what would Jesus do behavior. This is Christ died on the cross and made open to all salvation forever. Our relationship with God, that is open to all people. And when I start making walls and barriers, maybe I am reducing the gospel. That's the question. I, as a leader, have to face. We as a church body, community, um, denomination, whatever. Okay? And then the church has a call. The body of Christ, gathered and sent, has a call to translate that message into every human culture. Now, five years from now, let's have a reunion. And let's see how you've all done it. Let's just tell stories. Wouldn't that be fun? Joe will have it look all cool, and he'll have really good rhythm, and he'll like have a cool hat, and he'll do it. And you know, I'll just be kind of ordinary Joe, kind of you know, hanging out and doing something else that fifty-year-olds do, right? But it's both going to be interesting, right? Northfree's going to go back to Tanzania. Aretha's going to go back to Liberia. I don't know where people. I mean, like, just look at this room. You're all going to be translating this to different communities and using different vernaculars. That's awesome. Um, God's spirit empowers the church to be witnesses. Witnesses that carry this gospel, that translate the gospel, that communicate the gospel, and that demonstrate the love, the good news of God's love in Christ to the ends of the earth. Yet the church is constantly trying to put it in control in nice little packages, right? To reduce it to manageable proportions. Therefore, the church must continually strive for conversion. Are we willing to put our own selves up to the mirror and say, God, are we witnessing? Are we faithfully witnessing to Jesus Christ in this time? And are we willing to say, you know what, I really thought that that was a faithful witness, but now today, with new information and new context, I can no longer be like that. I have so appreciated Christian public leaders that have gone public and whatever and said, I've changed my mind. I've come to a new understanding. We can do that, folks. Um, we also might need to do some reconciling. We maybe need to say, I'm sorry I have hurt you, and open up space to hear stories of people that have been um, marginalized by the church, overlooked by the church, quieted by the church, whatever. I'm just wondering. So God's address to us. Um, the Christian faith is an embodied faith. It's not an abstract idea. It's not something we aspire to and we kind of float in the, in the world. It is actually a, a faith that takes on flesh and lives in God's world. So we have this relationship with God. We're invited into this, um, into this dynamic relationship. But God plants us somewhere <laughs> to live and to be. Obviously, this is 
evident in the incarnation of God coming to earth in the person of Jesus. In Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, God's love and promises broke into the world in the flesh. And now the ascension, and then here we're here. You know how the story goes, I hope. If not, we'll talk to me afterwards. I'll give you the, some verses to put that. But Jesus' life centered on sharing God's love by inviting really weird people, people that the church leaders didn't think should be a part of the conversation. Remember a couple of those texts? People got mad, right? They, yeah. They're like, Jesus, you're not supposed to hang out with those. Those, those people aren't religious leaders. You know, they're not the good folks, right? But his life centered on sharing God's love by constantly inviting people, pointing to people, to the creator of the universe that made them, that created them, that created this world, that says, I want nothing more than to be in relationship with you. And to say, the kingdom of God is near. I'm breaking in to say there's a new way, folks. Gentiles, get on the bus. Right? And we, as followers of Jesus, live this in body face. Our very lives and, and our Christian communities are called to embody this and to bring to life God's mission as a foretaste of God's promises in the world, right? Every now and then, don't you see it, folks? If you kind of squint and you don't see the people's faces, but you look at what's happening and you go, reconciliation has happened here. Or the good news came forth and somehow. Um, and then, now go into the world and be the saved, redeemed people you are and ambassadors of God's love. So, an embodied word. Um, and this is a dynamic movement. Uh, I got a lot to say on this that we're not going to get to cover it all today. But, but being the body of Christ is got two parts. We gather and we're sent. It's like a hug. If you hold on too long, it's really awkward. Right? So, you dance between coming together and going out into the world, and coming together, and going out into the world. And coming together doesn't have to have a building with a steeple and an organ and a hymnal. It can happen at a coffee shop, it can happen at the bus stop, it can happen in all kinds of places, right? I've seen it happen in hospital rooms that were once filled with noises and beeps and people moving around, and suddenly they became holy space. <clears throat> Because two or three gathered and God was invited in, and it became sanctuary. I've seen it in um, bleachers of, uh, of athlete, in athletic stadiums or gymnasiums where people are watching a basketball game or a football game or whatever, and suddenly somebody shares, I went to the doctor and I found out I had, I had cancer. And the conversation changes, and suddenly you're being Christian community unexpectedly, sharing more authentically than many people that come to worship on a regular basis because there's a heartfelt need and there's someone you reaching out, right? So this gathering is sent is this movement of what this embodied faith looks like. Church, don't just stay here. Go be the church. And then when you come back, tell us how it went. Um, my most memorable to this day, I have a lot of chapel services I've sat through at Lincoln's Chapel, was one by uh, Kelly Fryer, who used to teach here in leadership, um, who said, people of God, where have we been this week? So she started worship. <coughs> Since that time, I've wondered, what if we started every gathering by sharing stories about where we God's people had been Part of God's creative and redemptive work in the world. And somebody says, well, I got to hold my first grandchild. Amazing, right? Somebody else says, I got to da, 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 help a friend study for a test that they did really well with, right? 
And then what if we said, welcome God's church. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us gather and, you know, worship. And then at the end, God's church, go be the church, right? I think this is, this is my missiological uh, leading Christian communities kind of uh, critique. We've always had these movements. But so much of the church's resources go to the gathering part. And what's happened is the, the environment of which we're sent is harder and harder to know how to be and live Christian. And we haven't shifted to say, oh, are we actually being the church in the world? Is this way of being church actually working? And how can we help each other discover what it is to live and be Christian today in the world in which you're going every day? Um, for me, being a missional church is not organizing ourselves and imposing ourselves. It's going and living among and with people, earning respect to have conversations, building relationships. An opportunity to be God's hands and feet will show up. Yeah? May I ask a follow up question? Of course you can. How do we balance being sent with being changed by those who are already there? Yeah, for me, that's part of the dwelling. So part of being sent, right? is going in and uh, not as an authority, not as one with um, assumes that you have authority or agency in that place, but is going and being a mom, right? And, and wondering what that is. And that's when we follow God. God, how, we, how, how am I supposed to be here? What does that mean? Um, my best experiences are when I, I you guys, I hate language. I'm so bad at languages. And yet I love traveling internationally. I love building relationships. And so, for example, we spent, we have mission partners in the Dominican Republic, and we spent a summer helping start school there. Uh, I went out every day with the woman who was starting the sponsorship on this little moped to all these little communities. I've studied Spanish. I've done it in books. I couldn't talk my way out of a, anything. It, you know, leave me someplace and I wouldn't be stuck, right? Um, but... Um, I got to be guest for a summer. And um, as, a, as a leader, this was, that was part of a turning for me in, in my own leadership. I had been used to just going in, assuming I had a position. That's, that's kind of that cultural uh, assumption. And then to go in and to receive hospitality, to, to build friendships over time, um, and to know what that's like. I think that's part of our sentness, right? So we're sent to be guests, not just hosts. Yeah. yeah. Or not just proclaimers. Right. Right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that's another way to say it. I think we can, we can witness to the gospel by being guests. Right? So, so I think those are the challenges. Yeah. Is that part of being guests? taking the assumption out of it that you know when you can fix it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, and that's, I think, part of the Western church critique, that we have we have it figured out and we're bringing it to you, right? Mm -hmm. mm, maybe not, right? Um, so following God requires listening. That's why we do dwelling in the world. I think we have gone from, you know, kind of, a, a one-dimensional kind of thing to say, I think leading now is listening to our congregation or community, but it's also listening to our context. And that's, I think, where, for me, it's the first practice of leadership is listening. And that's God, right? But it's also neighbor. It's also the people we're serving and the neighbor, right? It's like if we had three years, would be good, right? Um, so what does that mean? Oh, that's a blank slide. So how do we know our context? Um, today, uh, would I, uh, I'll, before I go into that, um, you were asked in this time, um, in the post last week, to talk about the apostolic age, all right? Um, here's some things 
that that um, you all said. All right, and then I'm going to have you talk to each other a little bit. Um, I some of you, I loved it. What did your post and go? Oh, I forgot to do the apostolic, and you did a little, you know, addendum, which was awesome. Thank you for doing that and noticing. <laughs> that you did that. Um, but but um, I want us to wrestle with that. How is this time similar and different to other times in the church's history? Okay, and so put it in that. It, so what do we know about the context? Things are changing, and and our posture has to change. Our our way of being church has to change. So here's some things. Um, uh, thinking about the church and its the the politics, how it engages the context politically, and and this was a North American context, right? It's a little bit toxic, or in some places can be heated. So, what does it mean to be the church that when the gospel says this, but it's heard as a political party, right? How do we be church? in that age that was part of what some of you said um i loved your comment about understanding the church through the lens of little house on the prairie did you share that i i didn't mean to put you on the spot but but just share what you wrote in your post because i thought that summarized for me a nugget of our own context from afar go ahead when i was in there i used to see the little house on the prairie it was my favorite TV drama. And in the drama, the actor and their family, you know, every Sunday going to the church is kind of special for their family. Even though their family were not rich, they were wearing something special and beautiful clothes in the movie. So, um, and I was also thought that um, it's, it's like mandatory for them to go to church. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to go to the church on every Sunday. So I was able to imagine the culture of the church. And then you came here and it was yeah. different. <laughs> I came yeah. Here. yeah. Yeah. And at one time, that was true in at least many places, right? So it wasn't that Little House in the Prairie was a lie, right? But I thought that story to me captured an element of the church in the U.S. But how disruptive to then come and say, this is not what I see, right? Yeah, that was, thank you. That was a great, that was a great post and a great illustration that, um, Illustrated that. Anyway, so what does it now mean when the church when the church doesn't operate like that, right? Um, thank you, Timothy. You talked about how the rebirthing, right, and the reforming and some of those kinds of things, and had some hope. I think some of you said, "I'm glad you have hope." I'm not quite there yet. I think somebody's <laughs> response to that was right, but that's part of what we have to discover. Where is the hope of which we will lead? Because this is hard work, by the way, right? But there is, it's, it's kind of spring. Like, there, there can be, like, buds of some things. Um, Patty, you talked about quantity and quality was a thing that came up for me that made me, you know, we've often gone butts in the pew. You know, we've, we've done these numbers or things like that to look at church. What is a different way of thinking? about church and discipleship, you know, those kinds of pieces. I thought that was, that you said more than that, but these are concepts that I got. Uh, Rebecca, you talked about law and thinking about theology, right? How do we, how is it, how is it not just culture? I think I'm reading this right. How are we not just taken in by whatever the cultural conversation is, but how is our theology guiding us? Good challenge, right? And I think that's an apostolic question. Right? How do we be church based on theology, not just whatever the culture is taking? Um, Cora, um, you talked about um, racism and being unsettled, and having to face some of that in our own selves uh, as, as a white church. Actually, many of you had some themes about looking at ourselves and being willing to kind of um, confess our sins, to say, 
and to and to kind of be unsettled by that. Um, Aretha, you talked about um, Liberia and Liberia being a Christian country, but wrestling with. Didn't you talk about the uh, how that? Uh, what does it mean to be a Christian nation, right? And do you mandate that? How, does does it get legislated? <clears throat> things like that. What is exactly? I thought what a struggle, right? And many of you that responded to her kind of joined into that, both some of your African colleagues and some of your North American that we can't imagine that, you know, some of, some of that. I have had the privilege of learning a bit about Liberia, and so it was fun to hear some of your posts on that. Um, uh, you've already said this about this, the, the reflection on being a, a Coptic uh, Ethiopian and being an ELCA person and putting two different experiences about church in yeah, in, in conversation. Um, and I loved how you talked about um, spiritual, some transition stuff about physical culture. I'm trying to read my own writing. And spiritual, that, but there's a transition going on. And I do think it's multifaceted, right? It's not just in our practices, but it's also hitting, I think it's some of that rebirthing that you were talking about. Gia talked about some transparency. And I loved introduce the two loop theory, and you got Joe to Google it. You know that, but but I, what I liked, Gia, about that is to say maybe in this apostolic era, it's not only theology that's going to help, but maybe there's some practices or theories that we can help us think about how to lead in this time. Just just so you all know, I'm not a church historian, but every form of the church that we've used has come from culture over the years. This is not new. It's just when do, when do we let it go and when do we use different things? So I, I love that. Nord Freed talked about what is, it, what is it to hang on to this fast-growing church in Tanzania and try and keep up? Amen, right? I heard a little bit about that. Like how do you train evangelists and pastors enough as when people want communities and they're far apart and they can't get to places, right? Some of us want to learn about that. That was fun. Um, tell me how to say your name. Venetius. Venetius. Uh, you said it earlier, but the ecumenical part of Liberia, that was fun to hear <laughs> about what does it mean in an apostolic age to be an ecumenical partner, to have to work together across lines and, and different traditions. Um, v had a lot to say to a lot of you. I thank you for taking posts seriously. If any of you haven't gone back, look at your respondents. We had good, good commentary with a lot of you. But I appreciate um, what's a new generation of leadership. I kind of think you're right, V, that there's something's bubbling. Well, the leaders of today don't look like the leaders of 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? And what does that, what is, and, and at least for you, that was one of her places of hope for the future, right? That, that our leadership is going to change. Joe, I love the tradition, traditionalism difference. You want to say a word about that in case somebody yeah. didn't read your post? Yeah, no, I'll post it later. Um, yeah, I was talking about like the spirit of traditionalism, um, which I use a quote. Yeah, I said, uh, in the tr tradition is the living faith of the dead, and traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. I suppose I should add, it is traditionalism that gives tradition such a bad name. And, so, I, and I thought those, that together, mm -hmm. tradition yeah. in itself isn't bad, but tradition can be dynamic, mm -hmm. or it can be stuck. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think, so I think some of these complement what some of the others of you were talking about with forms. Um, Birgit Online talked about um, Christian's evangelism, right? Having lost some of that. And you can say it more eloquently than I. What, what um, how we have to reinvent or rethink ourselves. What would you add to that? Well, I think that 
evangelism has a really negative history as you're talking about with your experience of engaging missiology and that our knee-jerk reaction has been to not engage at all with evangelism to try to avoid offending people or to fall into that and i'm sorry apologize i'm using the we as in broadly elca um, many other denominations um, worldwide, the Lutheran Church has been better at this, and also many yep. other denominations in the U.S., but what does it mean to engage with people today, and how do we call them into maybe even just noticing the way that the gospel is working in their lives, and how do they find a community to do that with instead yep. of being on their own? Thank you. Well, better said than I in my notes. But I think that sense of in an apostolic age, we need to witness. We need to be able to share. We need to have that sense of regaining that. Um, Stacy. No, not here. No? All right. Hallie, right? Did I say it right? Yep. Um, you talked, and I loved about this, this sense of... Um, in our society, the anxiousness, or that, that there was some sadness, right, about that, but about what does it mean to be public and relevant, right? Yeah. And um, I think that's a really kind of like evangelism. For some of our traditions, that takes rethinking. We haven't known exactly how to do that, or it's take really limited forms, maybe is another way, right? It looks like this or this, but what does it mean to take that seriously? Um, um, who else we got here? I'm not going to go through them because I, we're not going to. Um, Jacob, you talked about societal expectations. You want to say more about that? Um, I guess in our in most mainline denominations, they expect that church will operate as it has for the last right. hundred years, at least in North America. Right. And uh, right. the upcoming generation is on track to be the most unchurched generation right. in American history. Right. That's our reality. Yeah. And so, what is it? What I mean, so being up at apostolic, right? How is it that we live into church when some have a church in a box, right? Have expectations of that and to move that. Drew, you talked about people, radical Jesus, and people over institutions and ministry in the world. Anything you want to say about that? Those are some of my things. You said other things too. Um, oh, I think where I was going with that is uh, looking at what folks can do instead of the big picture and thinking about the systems and the institutions and uh, how messy it can get with that. And look at what's right in front of you and look at the people that you're with and the people that you're doing this ministry with. We can. We often get caught up. Oh, I think. Yeah, we get caught up in um, like what color the drapes need to be, yeah. or what kind of bread we need, or very kind of pointless things. Like, yes, they need to be figured out, but that's not why we're here. Yeah, that's not the ministry. And I think sometimes we tame Jesus. Yeah. I mean, that was why I wrote Radical Jesus in the sense that I think Jesus didn't just sit in the sidelines and be quiet, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. And probably not popular yeah. with a bunch of church people, right? Um, let's just do a couple more. Um, Elizabeth, one of the, I mean, Elizabeth brought in her statistics. Do you need some, which was great. I appreciate it. And just reminded us how the U.S. is a mission field. Right? And, and one of the things I know about in the mission field is if you go in thinking you, it's gonna be one way, it ain't gonna be that way, right? So how do we live in a way and lead in a way that's more dancing with our context, dancing with the people, right? Um, you said some other things too. But, um, and, Lisa said, the church is static, still, and struggling. Those are three words, right? Static, still, and struggling. So what would it mean to bring the gospel into a church that's static? It'd probably be dynamic. That still, it would probably be dancing or, some, or serving or right something and struggling. 
what would it mean to be joyful or something? I mean, you know, like what is, what are those things? So that's some of what you said, right? Now those are in both big contact. And by the way, I intentionally made it vague church. And I love that you each jumped in somewhere because, um, it's all those things. We don't have one story. We don't have one story from Liberia, right? We don't have one story from the Midwest. We don't have one story, right? And so part of what our thing is about context is to realize how multiple layers are going on. And we are never going to understand the full story. But we can learn the layers. We can get to know the complexity of it, okay? So what do we know about our context? We know that our context has more and more adaptive challenges, okay? I want to do just a little bit on this before we end uh, on adaptive leadership. Technical situations, technical challenges can be solved with existing knowledge. In the past, the ELCA, United Methodist, has their own way, and other denominations have it the other way. But if a pastoral vacancy becomes available, you fill out a bunch of forms. Just so you know, candidacy isn't the last time you get to fill out forms. There are more forms to be filled out later. But you fill out forms, right? And then you submit them. Well, the good news is those questions came from a reason, right? They put out a ministry profile, and they they create the opportunity for a congregation to pause and reflect on where are you right now. The congregation I was with doing an adult forum on Sunday had a long-term pastor over there over 20 some years. He retired. They knew he was going to leave for a year out, went through that transition, had an interim, went through putting this together and called a different pastor and, and they went through the process, right? And the process served them well. Not only did it have them pause because they'd had one pastor kind of doing it the same old way for a long time. They'd also moved to a building, so they had some new space. But they had a person leave, new space, a transition where they reflected a lot of lay leaders and stuff reflected on their ministry. They interviewed different candidates that got them to think about leadership in a different way. And now they have a new pastor, and they're starting to lead differently. But all of this is kind of like the continuous change you know, nothing came from left field that interrupted the process. It actually served them well, okay? Um, in this, they had some people to guide them. They had some coaches, some people that had been through this before, right? And it operated within an environment that's fairly stable. In fact, right around their, their church, there's new growth everywhere. There's new homes, there's a, a new apartment or assisted living kinds of places around them. And so they're actually in a pretty good environment as a whole, okay? And so this kind of work can be done with planning and strategy and best practices, right? Do more of that. So in the midst of it, their children's ministry person left and they hired another one. And she's awesome, right? But they could basically replace that position. Are you with me? Okay, good example of how to do technical challenge. Adaptive challenge requires new learning, okay? Um, it requires uh, learning that must come from the people. Here you can have an expert, you can say, hey, Synod Office, you've been through this before, you do this on an ongoing basis, help us figure this out. This says, you know what, the synod can tell us for examples or something, but in the end, we're the ones that have to say is figure out what the problem is and figure out what are solutions, what are possibilities for it. And the reason is, is because we have to own the problem. We've had this conversation at Luther. We are in a time when we need to lead differently into the future if we're going to continue to be vibrant than we have led in the past. Okay, we're not shutting our doors tomorrow. It's not that crisis, but we have to act and be different, right? 
We've had conversations about, do we get the expert to come in and guide us in the process, or do we do it ourselves? Who's the expert? Is there an expert available? No. There's some people that could do process with us. The process is one thing. Right. But people internally can do the process, too. Right. But, but, well, but several times to to throughout the process, when we've had mm -hmm. moments where this question has come up, we've said, we can do it, but here's what's going to happen. At that point, the staff and faculty are going to go, well, now it's somebody else's. They're telling us what to do, right? Mm -hmm. Here, it's muddy, it's messy. We don't exactly, we have to, we have to like get in a room and work out what's the next step. But we're owning the process, the problem, the work. Does that make sense? And the, the reality is, we got smart people, but so do you in congregations, and in the communities that are invested, <coughs> right? So this requires learning from the people itself. It recognizes that the environment around us isn't what it used to be, okay? And then last, um, adaptive challenges touch on underlying issues of identity and purpose. It calls us back to, okay, our mission is, is to educate leaders for Christian communities called and center of the world around there. It gets too long after that. But, um, but we have to go back to, is that still our mission? Our identity has been to be an, in, uh, is to be an ELCA seminary that's mostly tribal. What do I mean by that? Norwegian jokes, German jokes fly. Is that still our identity? Not in this classroom. Not in this classroom. <laughs> but it's an interest. So, wait, lovingly, Professor, mixing cops with Ethiopians, for example, is like mixing Norwegians with Germans. Yeah. Right. So it, it happens a lot actually where the focus on center is the right people. Oh, oh for sure it does. Yeah. For sure it does. But the question is, right, is first of, first of all, purpose and identity get put on a paper, but mostly they get embodied. Mm -hmm. So their real expression is messier than any statement. Right? So we could put on paper that we're not Scandinavian, German, European, Lutherans, right? And the lived experience could be quite different, okay? Um, it's only when the community, like if I'm with my colleagues and somebody pulls a bad Oli and Luna joke, and I say, that's, that's enough. It's not helpful, right? And frankly, it's not funny anymore, right? It's only when we start living into a new reality or of saying, hang on a second, let's make space for a voice that, ha that isn't the majority, or, you know, and we, we create an opening into that place, right? And so, so part of what this does, and this is, of all these things, this one's the hardest. This is why, this is why people say, I don't want to go there. Um, because this is hard work. This is naming, this is having to articulate, I don't know, we just always have done it that way, or I don't know, that's just how I view God, right? I don't know how to talk about it, I don't have language for it, it just is. Well, we have to talk about it. We have to put language to it. Yeah, Gia. I just, I, I spend a lot of time listening, I was reading this, I was reading about the difference between technical and adaptive challenges just kind of thinking about the different contexts that I've been in, because I think that it is, um, it just seems to me to be a commonplace where um, the, the two can be confused. Yeah, for or sure. Or where the expectation is, is that all of them, all challenges are technical challenges. Right. Right? And so right. I appreciated the, the little bit of discussion that was in the book surrounding the fact that, you know, what that, what, what um, leadership what that type of leadership for adaptive child is, what that looks like. But right. I think that it can be really challenging, totally. even right. as leaders, to go in and say, all right, what are we facing here? Right. Am I crazy? Right. Wait, I'm not crazy. Right. Like, you know, which, right. where, where does this fall? I think it can be really... Well, and I appreciate you bringing that up, Gia, because I, I think that we as the church just automatically go to the technical. And human beings go to technical. And, and I think the adaptive correct. Right. identity is scary. Right. I know who I am, I think. 
Right. I'm but I think with you. this, let me finish this, please, yeah. and then I'll come to you. Uh, with this, I think it's okay if we try a technical response to a challenge, but then if it doesn't work, don't keep doing it. That's the insanity moment, right? So if you're feeling a little insane and go, wait, maybe this is a different kind of challenge. Maybe our response is, then I have to go, because I, I, it happens to me all the time. Then I have to go and I go, okay, step back, get on the balcony, which is a practice in one of the books that we or the book later on that we'll talk about, and just say, what's going on here? Might there be a different angle at this? Might this part be technical, but what we've happened is we, there is a technical issue here, but we have hit on a pulse of something way deeper. Is that, is that your initial stance generally though, to start with the technical, with the uh, I, technical? I don't, I think it just happens, is what I would say. I think there are clearly times, like I think the ELCA, one of the, their adaptive challenges is we don't all view the same understanding of scripture. We were talking about the view of scripture and uh, Lutheran confessions last Thursday and our subgroup or whatever we were talking about. We've never reconciled that. We have at least two big camps that are very different in how they play out. That as we merge to the ELCA, we never talked about. That's about identity. I mean, that's way deep stuff. But rather than talk about that, we talk about other things, right? And so I think, I think there are places that I know are adaptive from from looking but I think in my everyday work I, this is what we do and then we stumble into <laughs> like you know you go like this and then you go oh, I opened up a can of worms or I some I hit something especially if you're new to a community and you don't know all the stories and you're like wow that person just bit my head off I think I got into something. Lisa you're gonna ask a question all I was gonna say the thing that I like reading adaptive versus technical, it talked about how your your um people don't think all they hear is loss. Mm -hmm. Loss of identity, loss of communication. That's right. Yeah. But the thing I liked was, and I don't know where that's at because I tend to lean on the adaptive, <laughs> the yep. adaptive side, is they said give it to them at a rate they, they can, can absorb. That's right. And I think that's the magic bullet. Right. Right. That 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 is the right. cross between adaptive and right. technical. Yep. For sure. And we're going to get there because that's the next, there's two slides coming that have that. Most challenges have some of both. Okay. But, um, so, <clears throat> I, but I love this quote here by um, Benjamin Franklin. Tell me and I forget. You have a deductive challenge to face. Okay. Fine. Right. Teach me and I might remember. Involve me and I learn. Adaptive challenges have to have a participatory response. And they take longer to deal with. And so part of it is you have to pick your battles or pick which you, you can only do so much at a time, right? So some of it is some of the congregations that you'll lead or are leading have multiple things going on. Which is the most central or the most urgent in the adaptive world to go after? And I think this is, Lisa, the other thing to do. It's not only at the rate, but how you can only do one at a time. You can't do five at a time, right? You can't actually do one right after the other. They, right, they, they, because you get exhausted. You, you're weary, exactly. That's, That's exactly right. They can absorb. That's what stood right. out to me. Right, right. That's back to the, the Benjamin Franklin. That it, so it gets in me. Right. Mm -hmm. It's better to do one and slow and let it sink in than just go after. So adaptive change always involves loss. So when I was disrupted, when my husband came in and told me that. Um, Part of the crap about that is you got to look in the mirror. Because at the end of the day, I can't change the other person. I can only change myself. Right? So one of the things that you as leaders are going to have to face with adaptive um, challenges is suddenly you are going to be leading off the map, leading in an area where you don't have a clue. And no one else does either. And you have to lead anyway. 
And so you might have to learn new phrases like, I don't know. I made a mistake. Or whatever, right? You may lead in uncomfortable ways. Or you may say, they didn't teach me that in some way. Or, I've never experienced a church like that. Um, and people don't like loss. But I'll finish this and then I'll come to you. But if we are people of death and resurrection, we may just have to say, we're walking into Good Friday, we're going to live in Holy Saturday, and when God rises, we will be there to rejoice. But we don't get to dictate that either. Ah, I want control, right? The church so wants to control this. God doesn't go in a box. All right, Dee, what do you got for us? you have a comment? Um, or did I lose it now that I got to the death and resurrection thing? No. Um, what I was going to say is a lot of the problems and stuff that you are mentioning can simply be solved by individuals learning how to be discerning that they are teaching. Because I think we have yeah. too many people not to yeah. Everybody wants to preach, everybody wants to tell or write a textbook or be yeah. academic about the theory that you can yeah. to a certain degree. You can get a certain amount of knowledge about it, but at the end of the day, the spirit moves you, the yeah. spirit will move you. And if you don't focus on being that sermon that we yeah. want to preach about, yeah. you, you actually lost your word of doing God's work yeah. and you will take yourself out. I, I would agree with you and and I would say and if we're inviting others to adaptive challenges to experience loss know that we're gonna do it too right and and it may not all come at once right there may be um, a little death and a resurrection and another you know um, more stories we could say on that. Um, just a couple things, and then I want to I, I want to quick close this up so I can just say a few words about your project because we, we only got six minutes. Adaptive challenges require the people with the challenge to address it. So the role of leadership is not to solve the problem, and they so want you, whoever they is, to solve the problem, right? but it is to accompany and invite people into a process of discovery. Think as if you were doing marriage counseling. You cannot save or do anything for someone else's relationships or parenting situation or whatever, right? But you can accompany. We have other models for this kind of leadership, what I'm saying. But when it comes to leading organizations, we have somehow believed we have to have the answers or whatever. And so what does it mean to join hands, to bring people together, to open up space to say, well, does anybody else have a good idea? You know? Um, we already did that one. So, okay, that's enough for that. Big, big issues today. This is my review. Leadership begins with and followership and listening, right? Followership to God, listening to our community and our context. That's the leadership concept. Our context is in the big uh, time of adaptive challenges. How do we know the difference between technical and adaptive? If you've got those four things you have today, does that help? Does it help when I summarize what three hours of right? Okay, no, I hope it wasn't. Um, your course project, you have coming up uh, two weeks, is it two weeks? Your, next week, okay? Your 50 word description on your context that you're gonna study. So I want to say, okay, if it's 55, it's fine, okay? But don't make it 200, okay? Um, I wanna say just a couple things about the project, because this is significant. 
you basically participate and you do this project and that's how you pass this class okay you can do that there's not we, this course in the old curriculum you did these projects together and there was tests and there's other stuff we've honed it down this is the central part of this class this is how you work and think about these ideas think about a congregation a community uh, a nonprofit um, that is dealing with this kind of stuff adaptive challenges and is thinking about lead, leading in this time and its identity and purpose um, and as you come in as a student, think about this guest. You are a learner guest, right? You have a mission, you have a role, you're gonna get to inquire in ways that not the average guest gets to go in and explore. They're gonna show you their checkbook, for goodness sakes, right? You go into your, your friend's house and go, oh, I'm coming for dinner, can I see your checkbook? You know, that's just, you know, that's, that's, that's one view. But come in with humility with genuine openness to learn and discover. It may look like they have it all together or they're falling apart or whatever on the outside, but you might find nuances and all kinds of surprises inside. Be critical and appreciative. They may be up to something that is not obvious to you, okay? And they may be, I mean, there's a few dysfunctional families, mine included, that make it in the world, right? They may not have it all together in the way that we theologically and sociologically think they should, but they may be still witnessing the God's love in the world. So, you know, give them, a, give them the benefit of the doubt. But go in and ask curious questions and whatnot. Go learn from the people and with the people and quote the community outside that context, right? Um, so, um, some principles. Do no harm. Like, don't get the pastor fired. Don't like uncover something and then, you know, put it in the bulletin. I don't know, whatever. Um, that's not helpful, okay? Um, make sure you get permission from the leader. Here's the deal. You have to get access to stuff to do this project, to do this project, or at least some of their stuff um, of how they organize themselves. You need an advocate internally to do that. That can both say, you know, here's some people, ideas of people to interview, or here's some ways to get those records. Um, so you need an advocate, but they also have to understand what it is that you're doing. So on the course page is a letter to give them that says something about this. Um, it's more about just having them be aware. You can show them your course syllabus, you can show them whatever, so they have a sense of what that is. Um, I would love a paper or a scanned paper or email or something that you, you attach with it for me so I know, but basically get permission, all right? And if you don't have anything physical, you can just tell me you got it, but don't lie, okay? That's not good, yeah. That was actually what I was gonna ask. I know you wanted like, Email yeah, if you can, I that's great. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yep. that's fine. Um, I'm trusting that you're going to do this, right? And if not, I'm, it's going to explode on you later, is basically it, right? And if you're struggling with that around timing, so let's say your person is on, you can't get it till next Tuesday. Just tell me that, and we'll do it Tuesday. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, but, but. If we put this off longer, you just get in trouble. All right, protect the names of the innocent, right? And so no pictures with people unless consent, especially those under 18, all right? If you have like the backs of people, that's fine, right? But, but if you're gonna use any pictures or stuff like that, we don't wanna go through the, the permissions and all that stuff, that just adds another layer. And make sure that you're scheduling um, conversations with the leadership. And these are the deadlines, okay? If you have an issue that like, whatever that is. So let's say you are, wanna interview the fire department head that's two blocks away and you can't get that till a certain day and this do is here. Um, and that's really important for your paper or whatever. 
email me ahead of time and I will work with you with another date. But here's the deal. I got to read this many papers multiple times. All right. And so I just, I got a plan accordingly, and I don't want you to get behind. Also know that, look at the rubric that is in, that's available um, in your project guide. It's not in the syllabus, it's in the project guide. That's how I'm gonna score it, all right? So if one, so don't put all, don't put all your energy into two parts of the paper and forget the other elements, right? If you can't get that thing and it's only worth five points, go for the three in that section and move on. Did you hear that from me? This is, you, you, you can pass this class without giving every last point. All right, so look at the whole and, and plan accordingly. If you have questions about this, please email me, talk to me, whatever. Um, let's get you going on this. At the first I mentioned Catholic Church. Yes, I would like it to be a Christian agency because of the theological engagement okay. with it. If, if there's something, if that's not possible and you have another idea, talk to me first. Okay. okay. Thanks, you guys. Great, great day. And uh, we, I look forward to next week. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, hang on.